Order molding for complete dentures. Custom trays are commonly fabricated with a wax spacer, which can be left in place for border molding. However, removing it prior to border molding is easier and prevents damage to the border molding during removal. Ask your laboratory to remove the wax spacer before they return it, or use this technique for removing the wax spacer before you border mold. Prior to border molding, the tray should be comfortable and adjusted to be stable and not lift during manipulation of tissues. There should be 2 to 3 millimeters of space between the edge of the tray and the height of the vestibule. If the flange is too long or if there are any sharp areas, adjust these on a lathe or with a burr in a handpiece. Border molding can be accomplished with one of several materials. I will demonstrate with modeling compound, which is inexpensive and easily correctable or added to. Heat a low temperature water bath to between 135 and 140 degrees. The temperature indicator should point to the one on the 140 on Hano water baths. Dry the periphery of the tray, otherwise the compound may not stick. Heat the modeling compound using a Bunsen burner or butane torch until it just starts to droop. The compound will continue to soften after it's removed from the heat source. It is an insulating material. So if you heat it until it's really runny, it will continue to soften and be difficult to work with. Apply compound to the edge of the tray in a thickness just slightly narrower than the compound stick. Flame with a hand torch until all seams or sharp contours have disappeared. Then temper in the water bath for several seconds. This will prevent burning the patient. The hot water bath is set to a temperature that will keep the compound soft for an extended period. Once tempered, and if desired, the softened compound can be shaped with dampened fingers prior to interoral insertion. Border molding is easily accomplished with the operator seated and the patient proclined. Have the patient keep their lips relaxed and use a mouth mirror to slightly retract one side of the mouth for easier placement of the tray with a softened compound. Mold the softened compound by pulling on the cheeks and lips, making circular motions and having the patient make functional movements such as pursing or puckering their lips. Remove the tray and inspect. Material that has been properly molded will have a matte appearance due to contact with the tissue. If the compound remains glossy, this is an indication that either the compound hardened prior to molding or that there was insufficient compound to make tissue contact. Before moving on to another portion of the tray, trim any excess compound that has overlapped the internal surface of the tray or any external material that is thicker than four to five millimeters. Blend the compound with the tray internally and externally, so there are no ledges. Clean and dry the tray before adding additional compound. Repeat until the periphery is completed. When adding compound, make sure that the junctions between the molded segments are flamed to blend and eliminate any seam lines. At the posterior of the custom tray, compound is added on top of the tray rather than at its edge. After tempering, the tray is seated firmly in place. Excess will express posteriorly from the tray and need to be trimmed back to the vibrating line. Palpate past the hard palate until reaching the displaceable soft palate. Mark the location and have the patient say ah. The line should not move. Say ah. Uh. In the next clip, the posterior line is too far back. Say ah. Uh. Once the vibrating line and hamular notches have been marked, reinsert the tray the line will transfer to the compound and it can be trimmed to the position. Re-soften the posterior aspects of the compound, reinsert, and then have the patient move their mandible from side to side and open wide. This will mold the retrozygomal area to allow for movement of the coronoid process and provide relief for the pterygomandibular raphae to prevent impingement. Border mold the maxillary labial frenum by pulling the lip outward and straight downward in an exaggerated fashion. Be careful not to pull the frenum to one side. When complete, the labial frenum should be narrow and distinct, while the buccal frena are normally broader. When the maxillary tray is fully molded, it should have sufficient peripheral seal to resist removal from the seated position. If it does not, visually inspect and correct the peripheries. Border molding in the mandible is generally similar, but it is a little bit more challenging due to the changing position of the floor of the mouth. Pull the cheeks and lips upward and make circular movements. The posterior buccal aspect should be molded to allow activity of the masseter. Do so by having the patient close firmly against the resistance of the operator pushing down on the mandibular tray. 
Border molding should not normally extend beyond the external oblique ridge. Look for and mark with an indelible stick the crease between the ridge and the cheek posteriorly. Then make sure your compound doesn't cover this line. Another check is to ensure that you can't palpate a prominent ledge of the compound externally. Exaggerate the upward and outward pull on the labial frenum. Lastly, mold the lingual aspects of the tray. Both the posterior borders and the lingual frenum can be molded by having the patient touch their tongue to the corners of the mouth, up to the palate, and to lick their top lip back and forth. The retromolar pads should be covered at least partially to provide a seal and comfort. When completed, the border molded tray should not lift with normal tongue movements. Most mandibular arches don't provide the retention of a maxillary arch. Nonetheless, if there is a good ridge and you follow the steps I've two mirror impression technique for complete dentures. The two mirror impression technique can be used for any impression, but it is particularly helpful when one needs to capture the vestibular roll, such as for complete or removable partial dentures. The goal is improved visibility with full capture of the vestibule with a minimum of voids. In this video, I will demonstrate the technique for final complete denture impressions. Prior to final impressions, ensure that the custom tray with border molding is properly extended. See my videos on these topics for more information. Prepare your custom tray by removing any wax spacer and smoothing any sharp edges or areas of excess that might distort tissues or be uncomfortable for your patient. Blend any internal edges of acrylic or border molding that could distort tissues or cause discomfort if the tray is seated too firmly. Use acrylic burrs to adjust the tray if necessary. Place a number of holes in the custom tray using a number two round laboratory burr. These holes will allow release of hydraulic pressure to minimize displacement of movable tissues during the impression. They will also help retain the impression in the tray. Coat the impression with a very thin layer of adhesive and allow it to set for a minimum of five minutes. Use small disposable brushes or cotton tip applicators. There should be no pooling of adhesive on the tray. A thinner layer is actually more effective than a thicker layer. Place the patient in a supine or reclined position, which makes visibility easier with the added benefit of being more ergonomically comfortable for the operator. If the patient is fully supine, the tongue will naturally fall to the back of the oral cavity, blocking access to excess impression material at the back of the tray. The vast majority of patients do not have a problem with gagging using this technique. Place a couple of cotton tip applicators on the operator's tray for use during the impression. Instruct the patient to relax their lips and cheeks. This will make it easier to insert the impression tray. Begin with the clinician and an assistant, each with a mirror. Place the mirrors at the location of the canines and retract the lips and cheeks by moving the two mirrors until both the anterior and posterior vestibules are visible at the same time. By exposing the vestibular roll, impression material is able to flow to the depth of the vestibule without trapping air. This minimizes the possibility of voids or underextensions in these critical areas for denture retention. Prepare the patient for the impression. Lightly and quickly dry the tissues with folded gauze using cotton pliers to minimize repeated contact that could stimulate salivation. In the mandible, use a similar technique unless there is excess pooling. In the latter case, you may find that placing two to three folded pieces of gauze over the vestibules to be a better strategy. Remove them with cotton pliers just prior to making the impression. Remove the cap from the impression cartridge and express a small portion of material. Attach the mixing tip and express a small amount prior to loading the tray. Load the tray quickly using a slight vibration to cause the material to flow smoothly. Bring the material up and over the peripheral edge of the tray to ensure capture of the vestibular fold. Fill just enough to cover the surface of the tray with impression material. If the tray is filled fully, there will likely be excess material which can cause overextension of the flanges, distortion of movable tissues, and or gagging. Use a number 7 spatula to quickly smooth and pull material over the borders if necessary. With mirrors in position, place the impression tray interorally, beginning insertion slightly sideways and rotating it into position. Try to avoid impression material or tray contacting the lips or cheeks. Seat the tray in the anterior region first, aligning it with the labial frenum, and then rotating the back of the tray into place using slight vibration or wiggling until you see a continuous layer of impression material around the entire border of the tray. Seating the impression tray from front to back minimizes trapping air in the palatal vault. 
If there are any areas without impression material visible, continue to vibrate the tray into place until material becomes visible. Do not remove any mirrors until you see material around the entire periphery. After removing mirrors, use cotton swabs to quickly remove excess at the posterior borders of the impression to improve patient comfort. Then lightly border mold. In the maxilla, use circular and downward motions. Have the patient open wide and move their mandible from side to side to activate the pterygomandibular raphe and to mold the space available for the movement of the coronoid process. Exaggerate the outward and downward movement of the labial frenum to provide adequate relief for this important attachment. In the mandible, use border molding movements similar to that of the maxilla, including the exaggerated activation of the labial frenum. Additionally, have the patient lick their top lip from side to side to activate the lingual frenum and the floor of the mouth. Have the patient close lightly and briefly to activate the masseter muscle. Stabilize the impression without pressure while it sets so it does not move and distort. Never leave a patient with a tray in their mouth as they could aspirate material or become distressed without help nearby. To remove the impression, pull up the patient's lips and cheeks and place a few drops of water at the edge of the impression. Move the patient's lips to help break the seal. Finally, before removal, use the tray handle to slightly rock the impression up and down until you hear a break in its seal. Then remove the impression quickly to minimize permanent deformation. Inspect the impression for accuracy, coverage, and absence of voids. See my video on the evaluation of final impressions. The two mirror impressions